Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about today's guest. We got my man, Tim Ferriss, on the show. What's up, brother? Hey, man. Good to be back. <laughs> Very excited. This is your third time on, I believe. It and is. Uh, we've talked about pretty much everything that I could ask you, never kind of think of. I've talked about on the show. We just had lunch. We talked about a lot of stuff I've been wanting to ask you for a while as well, off the show, off the record. And uh, so I asked the School of Greatness members, listeners, what are the most important questions that you have for Tim that you think would be really interesting, not just for our work week type stuff, but something that, um, you know, you don't think you've ever heard him talk about before. So we've got a list of questions, you know, we're going to kind of see where this goes. Um, but also before that, I want to talk about what you've got going on. You've got, uh, something you want to promote that's coming out. It's not a book. It's not a book for the first time in a lot of ways. So yeah. uh, after many years of effort, the TV show that I did, 13 episodes, uh -huh. uh, is going to, by the time people hear this, uh, should be available on iTunes. And, and that's, on your website. And on my website, people search for it, the Tim Ferriss Experiment. So that was basically the, the video equivalent of the four-hour body. So yeah. each episode features me doing some type of crazy experiment where I try to tackle parkour or golf or drumming uh, was one of them drumming right? professional poker in a week and i go from zero to hopefully close to hero with the help <laughs> of unorthodox teachers and then in a few sure. episodes i actually am one of the teachers to show that it's not me it's a toolkit so we take oh. other beginners for say uh, someone who can't swim try to turn them into an open water open ocean swimmer in the span of you know four or five days they can't swim a lap in a pool, but can we get them to swim like a mile in the ocean in like 50 foot right. deep water in right. a week type of experiments. And uh, it was shot and edited by the team that does all of Anthony Bourdain's stuff. So it's very <laughs> super show. cinematic, very, very gritty, and I'm uh, really proud of it. So it, it's uh, it's been a long time coming to sure. get everything lined up, but now... A year and a half, two years now in, at since least, you started? Yeah, at least. And... Uh, it's uh, there's a lot of bonus content too. So nice. on, on iTunes, if people get the season pass, they probably get a couple of hours of additional content. That's cool. And yeah. what, let's talk about that for a moment before we get into these questions. What is the 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 task that you took on, or the challenge that you took on that was you thought was going to be the easiest challenge? That was actually the hardest challenge that you're allowed to talk about right now. Yeah. Oh, I can talk about all of them. Okay. Uh, I think that I severely underestimated. I thought they were all going to be difficult. I didn't expect right. any of them to be easy because that would defeat the, the, the point <laughs> of the show. Anyway, I want I want people to see me sweat. I want people to see me risk failing. And sure. I, I will say that I don't succeed in all these episodes. Like yeah. people get to see me crash and burn in a few. Wow. And uh, I severely underestimated how physically punishing parkour would be. That that <sighs> I will just. <laughs> I still have injuries to this day from no that way. episode. Travis Brewer lets you get beat up. Huh? Uh, well, Travis is bulletproof. He's, he, <laughs> he he's, is. he's a ninja and uh, very almost immune to injury, it seems. Yeah. Uh, but I have a lemon-sized cyst inside my right knee oh my right now from impact damage from that episode still today. Whoa. So that was a super intense episode. Uh, what surf, happened Surfing that? with Laird Hamilton was also oh. pretty insane. That's pretty cool. Which was awesome uh, and uh, terrifying. Because did I didn't you, learn to swim until I was in my 30s, which is embarrassing to admit, but it's true. Did you get up on a wave? Uh, I did. Or is that a cliffhanger? I did. I did. I did get up on a wave. And, did they um, film it? Is there a record of there's this? There's a lot more falling. There, <laughs> right, but right. Uh, but it, it's a, the, the point of this show, I mean, the premise is that you don't need to be superhuman to get superhuman mm. results. You just need a better toolkit. So I wanted people to see sure. in real time not just in retrospect. Because the four-hour body is like, I do this stuff for months and years, and then I write about it after the fact. This is where people get to see in real time, like, how sure. am I adapting? It's like, if I tear my arm, and I can't use my left arm for something, and then I have to do a drumming episode, like, what do I do? How do I adapt? What do I jury rig together? Um, MacGyver yeah. style. So yeah. it was a very, very, very uh, fun show to put together. So I, I hope people enjoy it. If they go to, I think it's just iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss, or they can just search there Tim Ferriss Experiment. There you go. Or on your blog, fourhourworkweek.com, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and one of the questions in here, I'm trying to find it right now, reminded me of this um, about, and I can't find it, but I remember them asking, you know, what's the one superhero that you connect with the most and why? Because you're talking about these superhero results. Yeah, I would say... Growing up, the superhero, one of the superheroes that I 
most of the superheroes I connected with were tortured in some way. Really? Yeah. So Wolverine. I, I mean, I was a, a serious comic book collector and huh. nerd for a long time. I still have probably 10,000 poly bagged cardboard backed <laughs> wow. comic books uh, at, at home at my parents' place from my first, I suppose, business in a way. I collected uh -huh. comic books. But I was a fanatic about Wolverine, Punisher, Punisher War Journal. And I liked these, uh -huh. I wouldn't call them anti-heroes necessarily, but these these extremely impressive superheroes or characters who were also very fallible human beings. You yeah, know, they yeah. had these internal conflicts because I, I can't identify with, with, say, a Superman, although I'm sure he has some <laughs> conflict. Right. But these, uh, these sort of pictures of perfection that some superheroes ended up being uh, represented as in these comic books, I, I couldn't identify with. And I, I much preferred the characters who overcame mm. their own internal struggles and hardship and doubt yeah. and self-loathing to do incredible things. So sure. the fact that like Wolverine would get his ass kicked and granted he has adamantium claws and some pretty amazing <laughs> regenerative capabilities, but he would screw things up and then he'd have to fix it. Same thing with, uh, yeah. with I guess, it's Frank Castle and the Punisher. So, so which uh, one was your, would you connect with the most, you say? Wolverine. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a badass dude. Yeah, though. Wolverine's amazing. <laughs> and I was so worried when uh, the X-Men movie was coming out that they were going to screw up the casting. Yeah. And then um, Hugh Jackman just nailed it's it. Perfect. Yeah. It's He's so perfect, good at it. Perfect it's casting. Funny. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, overcoming your own inner battles and adversity, what, were, what was like the biggest challenge you were facing internally growing up um, for the reason why you were able to connect with that message of, you know, being tortured? Uh, I think that uh, I uh, spent a lot of time alone. It was by mm. choice at a later point, but I was a runt growing up. I was really small yeah. until about sixth grade, got my ass kicked a lot, and I escaped into books, and mm. whether that was comic books or Dungeons and Dragons or uh, marine biology, I was really fascinated by sharks and yeah. all sorts of uh, fish. So I, I would sit outside, I remember even in first grade, with this book called Fishes of the World. And I would stay away from recess because I didn't want to get, you know, wedgie or punched in the face or whatever. And I would and I would read. So that was my escape. But wow. I think spending a lot of time alone gives you time to uh, meditate on the good and the bad. And, and I think in excess, isolation uh, can be detrimental and poisonous. You just end up chasing your own tail a lot mm. or beating yourself up. So in lieu of having other people beat myself, beat me up, I would beat myself up. You know, why wasn't I stronger? Why wasn't I faster? Why wasn't I bigger? Huh. Why couldn't I go out and stand up for myself, et cetera? And, um, you know, eventually wrestling was a huge tool that allowed me to overcome some of those uh, types of self-doubt because it was weight class based. I could actually, yeah. I could actually win. Whereas if I was a bigger bully, getting, yeah, if I was getting yeah. picked for a kickball team or a football team or something like that, there was no yeah. way that I would be able to shine. I would huh. just get decimated <laughs> yeah and then when i finally had a massive massive growth spurt i think it was after my fifth grade year and i i grew i'm not i'm not exaggerating the span of three months uh grew something like five inches and gained like wow. 50 pounds of muscle and came back and needless to say was was uh i'd been fueled by punisher comic books so i was i was ready to exact <laughs> i was ready to exact retribution on every bully in the class which was sure. uh, pretty splendid i'm not gonna lie oh wow that's cool um <laughs> Can you tell me about, this is another question from our listeners, can you tell me about one of the people who has been the kindest in your life? The kindest? Well, someone who's like just always been so kind, loving, and generous, and maybe the, never really expecting anything in return. Uh, the, the first people who come to mind are, are my parents, but mm -hmm. I don't want to give the, the, the expected answer. Uh, that, that would definitely be in first place, but sure. you know, hopefully for most people that's a given for them as well. Uh, I would say there were... Um, three people who come to mind immediately, and uh, there are many more, but uh, the first was a wrestling coach named John Buxton mm. at uh, St. Paul's. That was the second high school I went to. In Jersey? Uh, I was, no, that was before Jersey, so I was in New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, Mr. Buxton produced very cohesive teams, and he pushed each individual wrestler 
to the breaking point and beyond to prove to them that they had more inside them than right. they thought they had. Right. Uh, but he was much more than a wrestling coach. He was an English uh, teacher. He was also in charge, uh, at least in part, for raising an incredible endowment. I mean, he grew it from like 50 to $500 million or something yeah. like that. And uh, is now the dean of Culver Academy. And the if you look at the kids who came out of his program uh, under his guidance, uh, it's pretty astonishing to see how well a lot of them have done, wow. even compared to everyone else in, in uh, the same class, say, sure. the same school. Sure. So my wrestling partner, for instance, was uh, for uh, for a good period of time, probably a year, he graduated before I did, but uh, Charles Best, who went on to be the founder of DonorsChoose.org. Mm, that's pretty was cool. He the first nonprofit ever to be on the, the cover of Fast Company for wow. their most innovative companies. You wrestled with him in high school. He was my partner. Yeah, he beat wow. me by like one or two points every time until he graduated, <laughs> uh, which is really frustrating. He, his long <laughs> Lanky legs, uh, and That's cool. uh, so I'd say um, we could focus on that. Two other na- there, there are a bunch of other people who come to mind. I've, I've been very fortunate yeah. to have mentors who've helped guide me away from big mistakes and towards better paths. Uh, I'm not particularly religious, but uh, a reverend actually, uh, Richard Greenleaf, uh, because I went to an Episcopal boarding school for the second half of my schooling in high school. Uh, he was based, he was my resident advisor, my sure. guidance counselor, and uh, even when other teachers didn't believe in me or didn't think I could say get into Princeton, which I ended up getting into, uh, he was always there to support me yeah. and yeah. give me that extra bit of confidence when I was lacking it myself. Yeah. And uh, what you have to realize is, in, in, and I, looking back, it's very obvious, you know, my, my 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 college guidance counselor at this school, St. Paul's, it's a very well-known school, but he is he was incentivized to be able to say to parents, you know, eighty percent of my, the students that I advise got into their first choice college. Okay, hmm. now how do people game? How would you game that if you're just a normal human being, not a bad person? But if right, you right. want to be able to say that, the easiest way to do that is to get students to drop their their sights from really, really tough to get into schools to B, B class schools or C class making schools. Making that their first choice. To make that their first choice. And so right. that's what he tried to do with me. Interesting. And I politely that's left to that first meeting and we never had another one. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Greenleaf was uh, really there to be like my backstop mm. so that I wouldn't start l- listening to those voices that this guidance counselor had planted in my head. You know, yeah. no, this is gonna transfer. You took a year off to go to Japan. I think your your reach schools should really be, uh, or your backup schools should be your first class, your first choice schools. And then like Mr. Rutgers Greenleaf, or something. Yeah, and Mr. Greenleaf is just like, what are you? That's ridiculous. <laughs> like, there's no harm in applying. That's, yeah, that's yeah, ludicrous. Yeah. Um, so those those are two. I could keep on going. I've been sure. very fortunate, but those are two people who come to mind. That's cool. And and I should point out though that it was there. I think there are two types, and this is not something that I came up with myself. But there there are two types of of love and support. And you could typify them as sort of motherly love, which is unconditional. And then there's the fatherly love, which is conditional. Like you have to, uh, you have to earn it by doing something. Yeah. And I think you need both. One is not better than the other. You need both types in, sure. in life. And the U.S. I think is very prone culturally for political correctness and other reasons to just giving everyone a pat on the head, no matter what. And I don't, I think ultimately in the long term, that can be very detrimental if that's the only type of support you give someone. Right. And so Mr. Buxton is like, if you needed to go and puke in the corner into a bucket and then keep working out, it's like, all right, we'll get your puking done because we're on a clock right. and then come back and keep training because I know you can. Sure. And uh, <laughs> so it wasn't always fun, but right. it was exactly the medicine that I needed. Yeah. And looking back, it was hugely formative for me. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And would you say you're a pretty introverted person then from coming up from this being alone when you were a kid? I would say that I am hardwired as an introvert. So I find it very draining to be in big groups for a long period of time. Sure. Uh, Conferences I find very, very exhausting. Uh, Small conversations or alone time I find recharging. So I can, I can perform, I can teach and I enjoy teaching. So I can, get on stage and uh, become what people would perceive as an extrovert right. to accomplish that. But it's very, very draining. It's so. draining, yeah. I'm an introvert, and for sure. And one of the questions to follow that is, what's your best method for working with opposite-minded people? So maybe 
working with extroverts or people that don't think the way that you think about things? What's your best method for working with them? Well, I, uh, cause I would say you're very unique the way you think and the way you yeah. do things. There's not many people that work and think like you. Oh, and sometimes, sometimes people work and think a lot better than I do, uh, <laughs> or there are different ways to, right, to right. skin the same cat. And I really don't know where that expression kind of came from. It's such a brutal expression, but <laughs> there are multiple ways to skin that cat. Uh, and, and I would say that the most important lesson I've learned and repeatedly learn is that setting expectations. So whether you're dealing with someone who's more, say, artistic and less operational, <laughs> someone who's operational and less sure. creative, uh, or chooses to be less creative, right? Because yeah. they're interested in the execution of, of uh, very ambitious plans. Right. Whether you're dealing with a left brain person, a right brain person, or someone who has a different Myers-Briggs, making sure that the the expectations, if it's a professional relationship, sort of the, the goals are agreed upon, mm -hmm. the methods are agreed upon, uh, what decisions they can make autonomously are, degree to, are agreed upon, right. um, how progress is going to be measured, say on like a Monday and a Friday, like, okay, we're going to, you're going to give me an update on the KPIs on you know, the key time, performance indicators, yeah, yeah. i.e. the numbers you want to move on Monday. And then on Friday, you're going to send me a recap of how we did for that week. Yeah. And you know, what went wrong, what went right. I think setting expectations, and this goes, this applies to intimate relationships as well, of personal course. relationships. Yeah, uh, I think as long as you tr you do your best to set expectations up front, <clears throat> and uh, do that in writing, so that there's no mm. subjective he said she said sure, later. Sure. Sure. That uh, via email, so you can recall back to yeah, it. Yeah, via whichever. email, and if you have conflicts, and I'm very aggressive and very impatient, and I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's always a good thing. Yeah, uh, it can. I think it has helped me to accomplish a lot I wouldn't have otherwise accomplished. Sure. And I'm glad that I have a, a streak of perfectionism in me, but it, <laughs> it can make working with me very, very difficult. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the easiest guy to work with if you don't have that hardwiring yourself. Sure. And uh, so the other thing for me is that like if I'm pissed off, um, and again this is just me. How does someone get back on your good side when you like, are pissed off? If I'm pissed <laughs> off, it's uh, if you make a mistake, you have to own up to yeah. that mistake. Yeah. And a lot of people don't, and it's just, it's surprising to me. I that just, pisses you off even more, probably. Oh, for sure. Uh, but I, I would say that I if I get upset, what I have learned is don't send the email. Just. <laughs> Because I, everyone has to learn this lesson. I've done that so many times. But it's just times, like man. if you're pissed and you've had a bad day and you're <laughs> short on sleep and you've had too much cup of fear, i.e., coffee, don't send the email. Like nothing good will result. If it's true in that moment, it's going to be true the next day. So let it sit and like put it's on your so calendar to, to write it tomorrow, or give them a call and get on the phone. And yeah. th this is one of those lessons that I need to repeatedly learn. <laughs> and remind uh, yourself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, certainly, like if you're pissed off and you. Uh, the the lesson, or I should say, the mantra that again is not something I invented, but uh, I forget the attribution was: do not do not ascribe to malice what can be explained by incompetence. Mm. So it's like if someone did something, don't assume they did it to like get you because they don't respect you or because they wanted to cause a problem or they're like trying to screw up your plans for some reason. Just assume they're disorganized or they're overwhelmed mm. first. Yeah, and so, you know, and depending on the assumption that you make. The the tone with which you read their email is totally different. Yes. Right. Oh man, why do sometimes I just assume and take everything personally when someone when I feel like someone's just that idiotic? You're like, sure, oh. sure. And it's it's very uh, it's very very tough. And yeah. uh, so that's that's a continual meditative practice yeah. for me. Yeah. Okay. Another question from a listener: um, What would Tim tell his younger self? Uh, if he could go back and change anything about the past or tweak it to make anything better, is there anything that you would do or anything you'd do differently? The, yeah, this is a question uh, I struggle a lot to answer because... Because you're so successful with everything well, that's happened. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that I'm... A, a, I mean, we all have our own... Well, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but I mean, I certainly have my own neuroses, my own weak points, and mm -hmm. there are things I feel like I need to work on personally I've been very fortunate in the last however many years, seven, eight years, uh, to have had some tremendous opportunities and some tremendous success. And I think a lot of that uh, can be explained through probably just 
coincidence and serendipity and mm. and and luck. I think there's timing just, and yeah, yeah, there's a skill component, hopefully yeah, yeah. a competence component. But uh, the I would be if I'm quite happy with where I am in life, yeah. and I would be afraid of tweaking anything, sure, because the butterfly effect. And the, the ripple effect of that, I think, is completely unpredictable. Could change everything. Could in your change life. everything. Yeah. And I'm quite happy with where, with where things are. But if, if I ha- let's rephrase it, if, if I had, had to, to yeah. I would probably, uh, I think that I would probably go back, not to necessarily my childhood, but go back to when. I was really cramming and just working 24 mm-hmm. seven prior to writing the four hour work week after graduation. And I would mandate that I spend 30 minutes a day, like outside barefoot on the grass, just oh. during that bare, time. Yes. Just wow. get outside barefoot, be grounded, get out of rubber soles, spend a little bit of time outside every day. I think oh. that would have, I think that I don't think that would have sacrificed anything and mm-hmm. it would have improved my, mental well-being and uh, I think just general quality of life. Well, would you still be taking phone calls on the grass? It doesn't matter. You just at least on the grass. Just get on the grass. Could doesn't it, matter. I, I could, could have been taking be phone working calls. Or, whatever. or like, I mean, these days, for instance, in San Francisco, I'll batch people who've read the, the, the four-hour work week know that I like to batch similar tasks together whenever possible. And I will batch phone calls in such a way that I can go for a one to three hour walk through yeah. San Francisco. Sure. And That's great. you're making the phone calls. And in, if you don't need a visual reference in front of you, yeah, you might as well be walking outside, getting yeah. some exercise. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I think wa- walking is also very, very underrated. Mm. We've made a lot of evolutionary trade-offs to be able to walk extraordinarily long distances, yeah. even compared to other, uh, say, grazing mammals. Like we can go for a very long time, and that's by evolutionary uh, design, for lack of a better word. So I, sure. I feel like we should exploit that and, and utilize it. I like uh, it. What is it? What do you feel when you get a uh, barefoot on the grass? What does that give you? Uh, I th- I think it, sh- it it what it does for me among other things is uh, there there are people who talk about grounding mm-hmm. and the effect of getting out of rubber soles that that I think is up for debate the, sure. uh, the sort of scientific basis for that but uh, it helps me to feel grounded in a more perhaps metaphorical sense and that is feeling connected to the earth, not disconnected as some type of robot who's been programmed to reply to emails. (laughs) So just like getting outside and being like, you know what? Nature. Am I allowed to curse? Sure. Uh, But it's just like, you know, this, this, whatever bullshit I happen to be obsessing about, like it really doesn't matter. I mean, like a year or two from now, like if that guy who didn't reply to my email and I feel slighted, right? probably like, who knows? His grandmother probably died. Get over it. Get over yourself. Like at the end of the day, it's it's so trivial and yeah. I, and for whatever reason being in nature and having that uh that connection with the rest of the world and feeling not separate from it and uh, cloistered mm-hmm. in some type of office uh is is medicine has a medicinal effect for me yeah that's cool uh another question here I, I'm, I'm interested to hear this answer someone said i've listened to nearly every podcast tim's done and Tim rarely, if ever, talks about being spiritual or having a spiritual life. So do you have a spiritual practice or do you believe in a spiritual practice or is that uh, not something you're really into? Well, let me, let me, let me unpack this because this is, this is a good question. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would say that I, I generally don't talk. There's, uh, there's a, sorry, there's a second part of this question okay. I missed. In fact, he frequently uses the semi-negative term woo-woo to describe anything remotely close to it. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so maybe speak at all that. Sure. All right. So uh, there are a few different ways to look at this. Uh, I'm not particularly religious. Mm-hmm. And I think what I like to... I like to define terms whenever we get into potential sure. touchy territory. Of course. Because you'll have, I think that religion and politics, and I know people listening are probably saying, well, spirituality and religion aren't exactly the same thing. And we'll get there. But when <laughs> when I get into very touchy territory, whether that be politics or religion or otherwise, mm-hmm. 
uh, people tend to have very, very strong opinions coming into a conversation that they are not going to change. Yes. And particularly if they're emotionally vested and haven't reasoned themselves into a decision, it doesn't have to be religious related. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't reason them out of there's, that position. There's no open mindedness. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't find those conversations productive. Sure. So part of the reason I don't talk about, uh, say, religion much, although keep listening to my podcast, there are some coming up that do touch on this. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's mostly because I want to have a productive conversation where people take, can borrow routines and habits and so on from mm-hmm. these people. One could argue, I think, and it depends on how they define spiritual. I don't use the word spiritual or spirituality because I feel like it is so overused as to be uh, undefined. Mm. There, I, I don't think most people who use the word have a consensus of usage and I avoid that like the plague right. in the same way that I would avoid the word sort of toning and exercise. I'm like, what does toning mean? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about exactly what that means sure. before we debate it. Sure. Uh, do I have a spiritual practice? I don't have a, any type of organized religious practice. Uh, I do meditate on a daily basis. One, I think could argue that that is a spiritual practice of some type, uh, or a transcendent practice. If mm-hmm. we call it, if, 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 if we're looking at, uh, those is the same. Uh, if you look at or listen to, for instance, my episode with um, a PhD named James Fodeman, we talk about the use of uh, psychedelics for therapeutic and uh, mystical purposes. Sure. <laughs> and obviously, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. But that, that I think, touches on a, a curiosity and interest of mine. And you could call it a belief that there's a lot more out there than we perceive mm-hmm. normally with our our, our, our senses, with sure. our two eyes, our two ears, and so on. Uh, I have had experiences that lead me to believe there's just a lot more going on mm-hmm. uh, around us and inside us than is immediately observable. Right. Uh, is that remote viewing related? Is that some inherent aspect of multiple dimensions and string theory? Is it a, a grand creator of some type? The short answer is I have no idea, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, that is a long answer to a short do you have question. A, do, you have a, do you have a more? Do you have a belief as to which one you lean towards, or which one you want to believe in, or? I don't. I, I don't. And uh, I mean, I have what you might call sort of karmic guidelines sure. that uh, I choose <laughs> to believe yeah. because I find them. Uh, I find it helpful for me rebounding from challenges in life and for making moral decisions. So I, yeah. I tend to believe that what goes around comes around. And yeah, yeah. if you do good things, good things will return to you. You do bad things, bad things will return to you. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, those are hard to empirically prove. Yeah. Uh, and as someone who spent so much time in the world of science and science is really just a, a, a regimented way of testing your own assumptions. Uh, it's not, sterile it's it's a way of thinking that i that i find very helpful for avoiding confusion and delusion Mm. Uh, having spent so much time in that evidence-based world and manner of of investigation and thinking uh, i try not to accumulate too many beliefs that i i can't show evidence for yeah uh, because i think that that, that's it's a slippery slope and you can very quickly uh get bugs in your software that way. Sure. Um, but have I had experiences where I have, yeah, I feel like I have touched on things that are very, very hard to explain or even entities that I have, I cannot after the fact prove exist whatsoever. Yes, I have, uh, <laughs> uh, had those experiences and I'm very curious about these things, but mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't accept, um, I like to investigate controversy and sure and uh, test it whenever possible. And I'm a big fan of direct experience. But uh, you know, if, if someone tells me that the, you know, the, fl- the flying spaghetti monster visited them last night, I'll be like, that's fascinating. Like, tell me more. And uh, hey, if, if, there's, if there's a way we can replicate that, I'm all for it. But right. um, very, very long-winded answer to the question. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely think there is more to, uh, our reality than than meets the eye, yeah. and I think a lot of physicists would agree with that. I think that certainly any type of, uh, for lack of a better description, spiritual practitioner would agree with that. Whether they be a priest in the Vatican or a shaman in 
uh, you know, Tarapoto in Peru. I mm. think that they would both agree. Uh, the difference, however, I think is that most people who are listening to the priest do not have a direct experience uh, of, uh, uh, of which the priest is referring to, mm. whereas you might have more of a, a, a direct empirical experience um, with, with the latter. But it's, it's all subject to debate. But I, sure. I tend not to talk about this stuff too much because people get very, very upset. And quite mm. frankly, I've had death threats when, no I've, way. when, I've, I, I, when I've publicly talked about this before, uh, mostly from very deeply uh, religious people. And uh, there's, so the risk benefit for me of talking about this stuff is just it's generally, it. it's just generally not there. Yeah. And then you could just debate forever. Yeah. About and it's like, topic. look, I have, I have tons of friends who are deeply religious, um, but I surround myself with people of all sorts of diverse opinions and backgrounds. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the, what they share in common is an open-mindedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's important. Like we can sit down and I can completely disagree with say how someone b behaves in their marriage. But if, if they're willing to like come to bat and defend it, but they're still open-minded, like, okay, I'm open to being convinced that there are other ways to do things. And I take the same open-mindedness. Great. And it's a cool conversation. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Another question. What are you afraid of most? And what's your brain's mechanism for handling that fear or any fear? What am I afraid of most? Uh, afraid of getting eaten by sharks. Because uh, you, you, you live on the ocean right now. I live on the ocean, and I've spent a lot of time studying sharks. <laughs> That's why you haven't uh, gone in the ocean. And yet, so I have, well, you know, I, I don't think I've told you this. When I was in South Africa, at one point in Cape Town, my brother and I were going to go surfing, and uh, we called it off at the last minute, and literally about like 15 minutes later, a guy 500 feet down the beach was bitten in half. No way. By a great white, by a 16 foot great white shark. Uh, and one of my fans actually saw it live and oh tweeted. He was like, holy shit, just saw a guy get bitten in half by a great white shark. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And this, he was in uh, chin deep water. So uh, that's, that's one. That is scary. I do have a persistent fear of being eaten by sharks, but if it happens, meh. Is well, that why you haven't gone in? Uh, part of the reason, really? quite frankly, there are a good number of sharks around here, including, uh, I mean, uh, Manhattan Beach in particular, but... Uh, Especially when you see dolphins going over. Yeah, <laughs> right dolphins and seal. I mean, where like, there uh, are seal, there are generally sharks. predators that like to eat seal. So I... Uh, so how do you handle that then? Well, in that particular case, I'm going to go swimming, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it when there are other humans further out <laughs> yeah. who might be uh, more sitting ducks than e myself. Easier bait. Easier bait. Uh, the, uh, the, but that's not something that's a persistent fear. I mm -hmm. think that uh, I... I worry, and maybe that's the same thing, about watching my parents get older and about getting older myself. I don't mm. worry about death. I worry about the descent before death. And uh, that's... Do you mean, like, do you mean not being able to do certain things or like uh, as you get older, you're not able to be you know, physically active? Exactly. Or, Just mm. the, the decrease, the slow dr decrease and descent uh, into sort of senescence and, and being mm. non-functional and just right? being like, well, it's my Physically time. Physically or, or mentally. It's coming soon. I'm yeah. what am and I, I watched do? both my, uh, my pairs of grandparents with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. <laughs> so tough. And uh, so I, I worry about that more mm. than the end, so to speak. Do you think it's, I mean, I think I listened in your episode with Peter Thiel where he talked about his mission is now to like figure out how to extend life basically yeah. and how oh, to like yeah. live yeah. longer. He's like, I feel like, most people either accept it or whatever, but he's, he doesn't accept it. He said something like that, right? Do you believe he doesn't accept it? Yeah. And, uh, and, and there are a number of very fascinating uh, thought leaders in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley and elsewhere who are getting very strongly uh, involved financially and, and otherwise in backing technologies and companies they think have a shot at wow. extending functional lifespan. Uh, I, I haven't publicly announced this yet. I'm getting very involved with one of them wow. and uh, I'm, I'm doubling down and tripling down in a very serious way. The, the news on that will, will come out uh, shortly, I'm sure. But I'm not sure. I think that... <laughs> It's up in the air as to as to the future of some of these technologies mm -hmm. and how quickly they will be safely applicable <laughs> yeah. to a a even a even a small subset of the population. Yeah. And uh, but I'm curious to see it. You know, I think that AI and autonomous cars and all that 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 is going to come a lot sooner than people expect. Mm. And with that, I mean, hopefully we're going to be we're going to people think when Kurzweil talked about you know nanobots in the blood. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people thought it was, it was 
crazy talk. It's just yeah. nonsense. And I think we'll be there very, very shortly. Wow. Uh, and now that what effect that will have on aging per se, which is really a, a combination of many, many different factors that kind of go sideways. Sure. Uh, who knows? I think I think we we like to believe we understand the human body better than than we actually do. Mm. It's very complicated. Yeah, the body is very complicated. Yeah. Now, it, if, yeah, it's like if you if you can't solve cancer, how are you going to prevent people from dying? Right. Exactly. Uh, I mean, how long? Yeah. How many billions, <laughs> trillions, maybe have been spent on That's cancer true. research? That's true. Now, if you could um, take something that would extend your life for another hundred years safely and you know in a healthy way, would you? Probably just because, I mean, this is going to sound really, really morose and depressing, but I mean, if, if I could always Hemingway myself, if, if I was like, you know what, I'm done with this ride, yeah. we're going to be boiling in our skin because we didn't take care of these following, uh, you know, environmental issues. Like I, I suppose I can always, <laughs> it's easier to end it than to extend it. So right. yeah, sure. Why not? Sure. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Um, someone asked about lucid dreaming experiences. Um, how can you replicate for clarity on vision and capacity for carrying out life goals in lucid dreaming experiences. And have you done a lot of lucid dreaming yourself? I have, yeah. Lucid dreaming, I think, is an incredibly underrated tool. Hmm. Uh, and this actually comes back to the spiritual, mystical experiences because you, you can have some very unusual experiences in lucid dreaming that make you question whether or not you are really dreaming right. in a lot of ways. Uh, but lucid dreaming, for those who are not familiar, is they, a becoming conscious of the fact that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. And most people have had this experience. They're sure. like, oh, I'm dreaming. Weird. And then they wake up. Uh, what you can learn to do over time, and there's uh, there was a professor, I think he was a professor at Stanford named Stephen LaBerge, <clears throat> who wrote a very good book, which is a, a good primer on this, called Exploring the World of, of Lucid Dreaming. And actually, if people Google Lucid Dreaming 101 or, and my name, uh, I wrote an article on this. Uh, you can, you can, there are very pragmatic ways you can, you can initiate, uh, and extend the duration of lucid really? dreaming. And I got to a point in high school, late high school and college where I could experience three or four different sessions of lucid dreaming that roughly in coincide, uh, in one, uh, night, night okay. which roughly coincided with my periods of REM sleep. Wow. And I would use those for instance, to, this is, sounds nuts, but since I could extend the duration, I would actually, I was training for, uh, for nationals and wrestling at that point in high school, and I would train with an Olympian named John Smith in my dream hmm. on low leg attacks and it's very specific types of techniques with him in my lucid dream to get additional training time that I would hopefully take onto the mats the next day. Wow. And it transferred pretty well which is insane. That's cool. Uh, but if you think about the benefits of visualization, well, yeah. if, you, if, if you take the <clears throat> documented performance benefits of different types of, of uh, guided visualization and you translate that into lucid dreaming, well, now you have a full That's century kinesthetic reproduction. Wow. Not just visualization. It's like you actually experienced it. Yeah, you're basically... Physically. Exactly. In your dream. That's, Th that's, that's powerful. Right. Yeah, so... That uh, that is just one of many different applications I sure. think of lucid dreaming. That's cool. And we uh, talked about you talked about visualization in the previous podcast, one of the previous two we did. So I'll have that linked up as well for people to hear that one. Yeah, but lucid dreaming, um, I'd encourage everybody to to check out, and uh, it, it's it's a very meditative practice. Also, when you the the way that you get good at lucid dreaming, I won't drag on too long with this, but you have to get very very astute at distinguishing between a dreaming state and a waking state. Mm. And there are ways to do that, like looking at uh, the direction of, that bricks are laid in a floor pattern, for instance. And if you look away and look back, if it's a dream, the orientation will very often change. Uh, or a digital watch display, or any type of writing, huh. you look away, you look back, because your mind is recreating the landscape constantly, yeah. the writing will change. And when you get good at this type of observation, uh, you, you become very calm because you're generally doing what are called reality checks several times per day of that type and it's like hitting pause and checking mm -hmm. in with yourself and your surroundings so it's a very it's a very meditative practice i find yeah. the benefits of lucid dreaming training to be very similar to meditating twice a day wow very similar that's cool uh, so just talking about it makes me want to get back into it. <laughs> that's cool and someone someone asked another question about dreams asking uh, you know, you speak many languages. What language do you dream in? Uh, usually English. 
I, I have had dreams in other languages, but almost always in yeah. English. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to ask the question. Someone asked us a question about being lonely. Uh, you talk about how being lonely is often a big downfall of being a writer. So how do you deal with loneliness? being an introvert as well. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a constant challenge for me because mm. uh, I want to recharge on my own, but it's easy for me to fool myself into thinking <laughs> that that's what I need when in fact I need to get out and yeah. we've talked about acro yeah. yoga, but doing some type of, of communal activity, whether that be joining a pickup, uh, or I shouldn't say pickup, but like a club a club sports yeah. team of some types like soccer or uh you play taking, once a week taking and, dance lessons yeah, i think yeah. physical contact not sexual i mean it could be sexual i suppose but some type of of physical contact and this comes back to the the feet on the grass just like mm -hmm. getting back getting out of the prefrontal cortex and doing something that is very yeah. uh, sort of gr gratifying on an ape-like level, yeah. uh, dancing, it's acro yoga, playing. yeah, jujitsu, something that has some element of physical play and yeah. touch, I think is hugely restorative. Sure. Uh, so I try to do more of that. It's a lot easier where we are. I mean, right now we're in Southern California. Yeah. It's a lot easier than in some places <laughs> where you're Alaska. freezing your ass <laughs> off uh, or even in San Francisco where it can get really chilly. I, yeah. I, I like to do it outside. So it's been uh, part of the reason that I'm spending more time here in yeah. Southern California is for that reason. I think when people think of becoming happier uh, or, I, and I'm not convinced that that alone is a great goal, but <clears throat> for people who want to increase their quality of life, they think a lot about what to do, who to spend time with. The wear of happiness, I think, mm -hmm. is very underappreciated uh, and underexamined. Yeah. So the, the, the location in which you plant yourself often dictates a lot of those other elements. Right, right. So it's kind of the lead domino. And so for me, I've been experimenting with that type of, uh, sort of geographical focus. Mm. And uh, yeah, SoCal is pretty hard to beat. <laughs> it's pretty sweet here. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, two questions, I guess. This might be a trick question for you. What's the best investment you've ever made uh, in yourself? And then what's the best investment you've made in someone else? That's a tough question. Uh, best investment I've made in myself would be any time I schedule and record workouts consistently. Mm. That is just the scaffolding that allows me to do everything else more effectively. Wow. So anytime I get serious about training, all the other pieces fall into place. But despite that fact, it's very easy for, I think, everyone to drop that hat as soon as things get a little hectic. They're like, no, like, I, I don't have time to work out. Exactly, which is exact, it's completely the most counterproductive decision to make, yet it is a sin that I commit repeatedly. <laughs> so I have to, uh, but I do catch myself, yeah. and that would be, that would be an incredible investment mm -hmm. any time that I do that. And you say recording it though, you say that's like the second part of it is? Right, tracking it, so writing it down. Not necessarily recording the video. Well, tracking it. But yeah. having a system for uh, determining progress or lack mm -hmm. thereof, planning, etc. Yeah. It just gives me positive feedback in a very concrete way that compels me to continue doing it. And I also think that exercise allows you to diversify your identity a bit. So mm. what I mean by that is if you have all of your eggs in the one basket that is the book you're working on or the startup you're working mm. on or fill in the blank or your family or or your family or whatever, if yeah. you have all of your eggs in one basket if anything takes a turn for the worse and it could be for factors outside of your control you can become depressed and uh, your self-esteem can take a huge hit you can feel like a failure uh, i find it helpful not to not to scatter your focus but to have a, a couple of buckets mm. uh, or baskets maybe even two but where if you have a good day or a good week in the gym and you know it's good because you've been tracking it and you put 15 pounds on your deadlift or whatever it might be, sure. uh, even if other things go sideways, you, got something you can feel like you succeeded for that week. Yeah, I like that. Uh, in terms of the best investment in other people, I mean, I view my books as an investment in other people. Mm. And maybe that's a cop-out, but I do... 
I do one-on-one -on -one work with a lot of startup founders, for instance, and I do uh, work with charities like Build, where I've taught entrepreneurship classes to at-risk youth in Oakland, and I've done that yeah. type of thing. But if I'm looking for the Archimedes lever that allows me to not just help other people, but provide them with a toolkit that allows them to hopefully be far better than I am at yeah. whatever I'm teaching, uh, I think the the books are that that lever for sure. me. So I'd say uh, I, I view the, the books I don't write for me, the books I write for yeah. for that purpose explicitly. I want them to be a guidebook that help the readers to be to far exceed whatever I've done with the tools that I'm sharing. Do you have an idea for a future book? I always have <laughs> ideas for future books because it's an affliction. And um, <laughs> I write the books because I only write books when I feel like it's easier to write the book than to keep it in my head as this <laughs> nagging voice. If if the book has to be written, then I'll write it. But yeah. I, write, I find I find writing very very difficult. So there are a couple of ideas I'm kicking around. Nothing that I'm prepared to share gotcha. just yet. But they would uh, there would be no four hour at the beginning of the title. There you go. And it would a different be, chapter. It'd be very different from my previous books. Okay. They're very different. What do you think is the number one skill or asset that some that everyone should have? that will always further them in life. If they could, if you could say there's one asset and skill that you need to have in your life for business, relationships, whatever it may be. Being a good writer, good communicator in the written word. Yep. And huh. uh, I don't think it's hard to improve that. I think that uh, a regular practice of writing, it could be journaling in the morning for five to 10 minutes with something like morning pages. Uh, people can Google that. Uh, you can actually Google what my journal looks like. So yeah. what my journal looks like literally, and then my name and, and some examples will pop up. But having a, a regular writing practice, and it could be just an assignment that you give yourself once a week, and you're going to write three to five pages, and then you're going to pay someone to edit it or to review it. Mm. And that could be a teacher at a local college who does, say, creative writing classes, or it could be a friend who's a lawyer or a lawyer. Lawyers are very good at, uh, not not all of them, but they're, they're very good at spotting sloppy language sure. or sloppy thinking. Words that are unnecessary, words that are easily confused. Mm -hmm. And uh, just that practice of tightening up your writing will tighten up your thinking. Hmm. And so if you want to improve your thinking, the most concrete tangible way to do that that is easy to manage is having a regular writing practice of mm. some type and the goal isn't to become a better writer the goal is to become a clearer thinker huh. and no matter what you are doing in life you are going to have to especially in a digital world where where email is going to remain right. king for the foreseeable future and if not email it's going to be text there will be a text sure. component uh, because people can answer it asynchronously then you need to be a compelling communicator. And uh, there's a book called On Writing Well that I think is a very good investment for people. There is a book called Bird by Bird, if you, which is hilarious and very, very good for dealing with some of the neuroses that writers have, uh, particularly if you're interested in fiction, which is an area I want to get into. But uh, And then I would suggest very closely related to that is getting good at negotiating. So mm. communicating, negotiating, they're, they're two So written and then verbal communication. Written and verbal. Uh, there's a program called Secrets of Power Negotiating mm. by, I think it's Roger Dawson. And the audio version is exceptional to listen to because you, you are able to pick up the nuance of the intonation yeah. and the delivery. Uh, and then you role play that. And I mean, really, you... I'm blanking on my quotes here. Ar Archilochus, <laughs> I think it was a... It must have been a Greek of some type, general perhaps, <laughs> let's just say as a general. But the, uh, his quote, and I'm paraphrasing this, was something along the lines of, we do not we do not rise to the level of our expectations, we fall to the level of our training. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to practice. Of you can't expect to read a book on negotiating, walk into a huge negotiation that you're nervous about and knock it out of the park. No. You have to role play it, you have to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think with the, the one asset would be honing your clarity of thought by some type of regular writing practice. Sure, I like that. As uh, you know, two guys sitting here, former bullied elementary school kids here, what do you think are some good ways to increase confidence for anyone or what are some ways that you did to increase confidence along the way and what are some things other people can do? Increase confidence for people in general or for kids? or yeah, In general, let's say adults, people listening. 18 and up. I, 
I really think that I think that positive thinking is overrated. So what I mean by that is, uh, or let me phrase that a different way. I think positive thinking is necessary, but not sufficient. Mm. So what I've noticed, and this is very common, for instance, in the meditation world, (laughs) you'll see people, I mean, I've met some tremendous meditation teachers, uh, and some of them defy this, this, this description, (laughs) but they're, they're outside of the action, right? So they're at a monastery, uh-huh. they're, they're somewhere very, with minimal inputs, and they're the, the picture of uh, patience and calm and so on. But I've seen they're some of those traffic people, all day long. exactly, <laughs> when you throw them into the front, you know, onto the front lines, and people are telling them <laughs> to fuck off, and they're honking behind them, they lose their shit. Yeah. And I think that you need to make yourself uncomfortable. Mm. So if you have a, and that's why in the four hour work week, these comfort challenges are so important. I mean, and, and they seem silly, but there's a point, there's a very, there's a very, uh, transcendent, uh, or important benefit that you get from say going into a Starbucks and laying down on the floor for 20 seconds and not saying anything to someone and then just getting back up. And that's a comfort challenge. Most people do not yeah. want to do it and they'll do that and they'll get up and they'll be like, wow, I was so nervous about that and nothing bad nothing happened. Nothing happened. Exactly. And when you expand your sphere of comfortable action by doing things that make you marginally uncomfortable, yeah, uh, you get better at asking yourself and answering the question, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. And you realize not much. Mm. Like really I've done all these other things. I thought were going to be these horrible experiences and I was totally fine. Sure. Great. So let me try a, B or C that I was, that I am worried about. Right. Or was previously worried about. So I think that you, you have to inoculate yourself against fear Mm -hmm. by exposing yourself to fear. It's the only way, it's the only way you can do it. Yeah. When I was, uh, I think I was 15 or 16 in the summer going to like junior year of high school. I was really, I was starting to like get into my body and I was terrified of women still. Mm-hmm. Like I could talk to them, but I couldn't go up to strangers. Yeah, right. I'm if still I, terrified of women. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I remember being like, I'm sick and tired of not being able to talk to girls cause this is pissing me off. When yeah. all these other guys are like able to talk and just go up and have fun, I couldn't do it. So I gave myself this challenge and I wish I would have read the book. The book would have came out, you know, 15 years ago, I could have done it. But I gave myself the challenge of every time I see a girl that makes my heart flutter right. or that I'm like nervous by, I have to go up to her and ask her for a number and start a conversation with the intent of asking her for a number. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, man, at the end of the summer, I was really good. <laughs> it was so terrifying the first week. Yeah. Cause I was like, what's, you know, what's going to happen? They're going to reject me. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to talk about me, but it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Even when I did fail, I was like, oh, well on to the next girl. Right. Exactly. Right? And uh, it, I really believe in that. It's a practice. It's a practice. You yeah. can't, I, I don't think you can, your subconscious is really, really on point and honest in a lot of ways. And you can't fool yourself into being confident just by repeatedly telling yourself yes, to be confident. Be positive. You got this. You, you got have this. to go. You have to incrementally do things that make you routinely uncomfortable. Yeah. I and like uh, so it's like uh, one that uh, <laughs> actually in the TV show, <laughs> in the Tim Ferriss experiment. So one of the episodes is on building a business. And we uh-huh. and so Noah Kagan and I yeah. of, uh, of uh, AppSumo. AppSumo. Uh, love Noah. Yeah, tutored this this uh, woman. I'm not going to spoil the uh, all all the the details, but he was building a business, and one of the things he had her do, like right on the spot, she had no no prompting for it. He was like, "All right, go inside, and get a coffee, and ask for twenty percent off. Wow, and see if you can get twenty percent off of off coffee. of your coffee. Just wow. just and." Uh, so uh, download and, the episode to see what happened. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there's, there's a lot more. Yeah. There's, yeah. You want to talk about comfort challenges. There's a lot in that wow. episode, but the, uh, just the act of doing these little things that make you uncomfortable, yeah, like hugely, that. hugely valuable. I like that. Very cool. All right. I want to get to a, a few last questions. Um, one that you ask, I think sometimes I've heard you ask this at the end of your episodes is, I think you say the question like, I'm going to ask you something and then you just give me the first response. And one of them is punching someone in the face. <laughs> I think that's a question you asked, yeah, right? Yeah. Who's, who's, uh, so, whose face comes to mind so, when you think of the word punchable? Yeah. So who is that for you right now? <laughs> oh, man. You know, and I realize why this is a tough one to answer because people don't, you know, for, there's another expression, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. And uh, let, let me think about that. I'll give you a real answer. So... Um, I'll give a general answer and uh, 
but it's true. And this, this is, I've, I've really, I feel like I've aged 10 years mm. just fighting this battle internally. Uh, pretty much every kind of mid-level big company bureaucrat who's tried to veto creative decisions of mine makes me so furious. It's hard to even verbalize how angry that makes me Wow! because they've never had their own skin in the game. They've never had, they've never had to stand on stage and risk getting booed. They've never had to put out something and risk, uh, not even getting booed, but just getting crickets. They've sure. never, they've never had to like stare down the barrel of the gun and potentially bite that bullet. They've mm. never had to do it. Yeah. And so for them to veto or interfere with any creative decision on uh, my part just makes me fume mm. and uh it's i'm not saying it's helpful for me to fume but that's my response so it definitely yeah. makes me want to punch wow okay <laughs> and kick and elbow and knee and <laughs> sure. stomp and the whole sure. nine yards <laughs> so far haven't acted it out uh another question if you were given let's say 50 billion dollars right now handed to you and someone said the only thing you can do is use this to help the world what would you do to help the world with that money you couldn't use it for yourself but you had to use it for 50 billion. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is focusing on the global literacy X prize uh, or something very closely aligned with that. So mm. uh, determining how to create a software program that is open source that can be put onto smartphones, any type of say Android device and beyond that allows children in any country in the world to develop basic literacy and numeracy skills without a teacher. Mm. So software that they can pick up, figure out, that will take them through uh, the teaching of these things in some type of compelling way that competes well against all the other things they can access. Uh, I think that that would be the first place I would focus. But quite frankly, I would get a bunch of people in the room who yeah. are smarter than I am who have had to make decisions like this, uh, maybe not with 50 billion, but uh, with billions, certainly. Sure. And I would sit down and be like, okay, what's what's what are the biggest mistakes that people make when they're yeah. in the, put into this situation? And, uh, but I think the, 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 the building, I would basically take my goals that I have already with the books and 4-Hour Chef and with the Tim Ferriss Experiment, the TV show, the, the, all of these are aimed at providing people with a superior toolkit mm -hmm. that makes them world-class yeah. innovators and problem solvers. And if you can take, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who currently do not have the capability to be uh, far reaching problem solvers because they don't have basic literacy and numeracy mm. and you provide that to them, it also helps prevent, I think, a very large percentage of them from becoming problems. Right. Uh, and they become contributors instead of just pure consumers. So th that, that would be where I would focus, at least offhand, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. I consider you probably one of the most elite problem solvers out there. And Thank you. Yeah. And besides the uh, the not having the solution of living forever, what's the one problem you have yet to solve that eats you the most, eats at you the most? Uh, how to do side splits like Van Damme between two chairs. <laughs> that is pretty sweet. <laughs> Although yeah, I don't think I could do that it's anymore. It's been on my to-do list for 30 years, but uh, I, th I think I may just have to give up on that. I, I, there isn't really any pragmatic benefit to me doing that, but I've always fantasized about being able to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, blood sport style. But the uh, other problem that I haven't been able to solve... Well, I'm working on it, but uh, quite frankly, and this is not something I expect people to sympathize much with, but um, I'm good at saying no. I have to get 100 times better. Mm. I'm, I mean, I say no to 99 out of 100 things that come my way, Yeah. but I have to get to the point where I'm saying no to 999 out of 1,000 things. Yeah. I mean, I saw uh, your email yeah, it's, backlog. It's is just, it, even with all the filters, all the structures... Uh, the, the assistants, the gatekeepers, with, the even with all, all of, even, even with all of that, the volume is is incredible, and I mm. think that. So how do you solve that? I have to create systems, and I also have to, I think, ultimately upset a lot of people, and I'm not used to that. Uh, I, I'm mm. accustomed to being able to sort of politely decline a lot of things, and some yeah. people would take it personally, but I'm, it's going to have to get to a point where uh, nobody on my team even acknowledges receipt of 99% of what we get. Wow. And people will get very upset by that. Wow. And uh, it's 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 an interesting 
it's an interesting transition for me. I mean, I, I, there's a great book written by Derek Sivers. I think it's Anything You Want. I could be blanking on the title. It's very, very short. Derek Sivers is a fascinating guy who yeah. built, it, built up a company called CD Baby, sold mm-hmm. it for, I think it was 24, 27 million. Uh, gave most of it to charity, as I understand. And just like a philosopher king of the first class, a really fascinating guy. And one of his chapters, which I think started as a blog post, but he talks about it. He, he talks about the few situations he's been in and then saying no if it's not a hell yes. So if it's not a hell, like an enthusiastic hell yes, That's it's a good. no. I like that. There's nothing in between. Like it's not that. okay paying me in two months. It's not maybe, why don't we talk about it next quarter. If it's not like, oh my God, I have to do this right now, it's a no. It's a no. And That's interesting. That you end up having to throw out a lot of very cool opportunities if you take that lens. But it's not a hell yes. Uh, right. And particularly when, let's say I get a cool opportunity to come to me or even an email introduction from somebody I know, yeah. but it's one of 999 other such introductions. If I even reply, oh my gosh, uh, it'll turn into another two or three emails yeah. very oftentimes no, uh, because people have been taught to be persistent. And I will tell you with busy people being overly persistent is not a good thing. <laughs> uh, you have to have patience. Hear the message. Yes. And uh, I, you know, in retail, it's location, location, location. With reaching out to busy people, it's timing, timing, timing. Like, mm. wait until the timing is right. And how is the timing right? For instance, like if I want to reach out to a, a, a A-list celebrity to be, to be on my podcast, I am going to try to figure out through back channels or their managers or whatever when they are going to be doing press junkets to promote something they're doing because mm. that is when they'll be scheduling all of this stuff. Yeah. And uh, I will not waste my breath and infuriate the team by trying to be insistent outside of those pockets of time. Sure. That's smart. Uh, because they are just as busy, if not more busy than I am. Yeah. Uh, so that was a long, long answer, but the, no, this, this saying, no, I have to get much better at, and I think I'm, I'm going to have to publish pretty soon a couple of sort of public declarations of <laughs> like a manifesto, e- e- like email, <laughs> email bankruptcy. I'm taking a startup vacation for the next six months. Like wow. don't, don't send me any email intros, et cetera, et cetera. And if you emailed me in the last six months, I'm Sorry. not getting back to you. Sorry. I can't get back to you. Yeah. Amazing. And it's going to piss off a lot of people, but I think at the end of the day, you, there, there is a point where you have to choose between your own sanity mm-hmm. Uh, and pleasing everyone else and pleasing everyone else. Yeah. And even if you try to please everyone else, you can't. You can't. So it, it's really no choice at all. So you please you, yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or just save yourself <laughs> as a starting point. Um, so I think, this, yeah. yeah, I think, but was it Warren Buffett who said the difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say no almost hundred percent. That's of the right. Time. Yeah. Something he like he that, said right? that. And then also I think it was Steve Jobs who said, uh, Oh God! It's and I'm, I'm I'm misquoting, but it's something along the lines of you know to to do anything great, you have to say no to a thousand things, Amazing. and um, say no, say yes to one thing. Yeah, exactly. Basically, so that that's right? something that I think I'm very good at. I'm better than I think the vast majority of of people I've bumped into uh, generally, and that's yeah. by training, not by any innate ability. It's just through training. But I have to get better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. A couple quick questions left. Um, one is if all of your books. And all of your writings uh, were deleted. <laughs> Everything you've ever put out there on a blog post. Uh-oh. Yeah. It's the last day of your life, 150 years from now, because you've extended it. Everything's deleted. And you had three truths about life to write down and pass on to your family and to the world. What were those three truths? Jesus, man. <laughs> well, and you couldn't, <laughs> you, all the information you've learned, yeah. all the stuff you've written, you know, yep. the millions of books you've sold, what are the three things that you would say are true about life as you know it? Yeah. Uh, that is a very large question, <laughs> Lewis. I said it was a quick answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> long have, long pause followed by a short answer. Let's it doesn't see. have to be perfect, but what, come, what comes uh, the up first, for you? I'll give you two. So yeah. the first two that come to mind are... You're the average of the five people you associate with most. Like that. You know, financially, physically, emotionally. Mm-hmm. And if someone tells you you have to do something or should do something, ask them ask them for the evidence. Mm. Ask them what evidence suggests that. And uh, the underlying theme being test assumptions. You have to test assumptions. Mm. I have to do this or this. Really, like what evidence mm. do you have that suggests that? that right. I'm limited to those two options. And okay. if they can't answer you, they don't, then you shouldn't take that advice. Right. Uh, there's a lot of speculation and just, uh, 
just making up of the rules as we go along. And I think that uh, people people get trapped in prisons of their own making because mm. they accept limitations that other people place on them or that they place on themselves just yeah. as often. So, yeah. you know, if you or someone else says you have to do X or you should do Y, ask what evidence is there to support this? Mm. Okay, those are great. Do you have one more that came off the top of your mind? One more truth? Uh, treat health as number one because without it, everything else will fall apart mm. and with it, everything else becomes easier. I like that. Very cool. Um, three books you'd leave behind. If you could only leave three besides your own, <laughs> what would the three books that you would recommend if, you know, you couldn't even have the three truths and no writings, but you're just like, here, family and friends, three books is all you get. What would that message be? Uh, it's toughy. Uh, the first three that come to mind, I mean, I, I, I'm a book lover. There are many, many books that I love, but the first would be uh, Letters from a Stoic uh, by Seneca. The second would be Zorba and the Greek, or I'm sorry, Zorba the Greek, excuse me, Zorba the Greek, which is a novel with a, with a lot of similar messages, I feel. Uh, a, a close cousin to that would be Vagabonding, but uh, so I'll give one. Which, I, which you gave to me I have over here somewhere up on the shelf. Yeah. Vag oh, it's, oh, it's a great yeah. book. So so uh, Letters from Stoic by Lucius Seneca, which is 2,000 plus years old. Then Zorba the Greek. And uh, then last, just one for, I suppose, business career purposes, uh, the 22 immu Immutable Laws of Marketing. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. I think that's, I think those, those will take people pretty far. Very cool. I like it. Well, okay. Let's, well, let's wrap it up. Uh, again, make sure to go to your site, but also to iTunes and get the show that's yeah, coming definitely, out. Definitely. Definitely. So the Tim Ferriss experiment, you can search for it on iTunes or, uh, it should be available if you go to iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss also. Very cool. But and when in doubt, you can just search, search the Tim Ferriss experiment. It should pop up somewhere. And it's on your blog as well. Yeah. And what uh, is a question you want to ask for the listeners that they will answer on the comments of just about any question you may have for them? Yeah, to for sure. Uh, well, sort of in the in the spirit of the show, uh, trying to show people that they can do a lot more and much in very short periods of time than they ever thought possible. You know, if if you could become world class at any skill in the next six months, hmm. what would that skill be? And uh, particularly if it's something that you dreamed of and dreamed of and put up on a shelf and gave up on, right. what is one skill you'd like to become world class at in the next six months, which means top 5% in the general population in the world. Mm. Very cool. you don't, so it's, if it's tennis, you don't have to win the, you don't have to win Wimbledon, Wimbledon. <laughs> right? It's not, don't measure yourself against professionals, yeah. but like top 5% in the general yeah. population. What is one skill in the next six months? Because I think that's plenty of time. Sure. To accomplish yeah. that type of thing. And that's what the show is about for you. That's right. Teaching that. And that's cool. Yeah. So answer in the comments below. I'll tell you guys what that link is here. Uh, before I ask the final question, which you've answered a couple of times, you know, I don't think people acknowledge you enough. So I want to acknowledge you for a moment for, uh, you know, you've changed so many people's lives. You've inspired so many people through your books, through your writing, through your information, through everything you put out there. And you've definitely been a huge inspiration for me. I can honestly say that everything around me, being here, what I'm up to in my life right now would not happen without you, Tim. So thank you, Liz. Uh, I want to acknowledge you for being so um, committed to greatness in your own life and educating others how to do it for themselves because it comes through in your work and uh, it's definitely a lot of people who have benefited from it. And a lot of friends that I know have read your books and read your blog and listen to your podcast. It's changed their lives. So I want to acknowledge you for being an incredible human being and giving us great tools to be great as well. So thank well, you, thank you Lewis. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, humbling and uh, certainly an, an honor to hear that. And uh, you've, you've, uh, you've really done an incredible job of uh, passing on your learnings to your audience. So keep up the great work. Yeah. Thanks yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, final question. What's your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness in the moment in the moment is uh, trying to be just a little bit better inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter, <laughs> uh, whether it's the next day or the next week and not beating yourself up about it. If you fail for an entire week, for an entire month, 
uh, just get up and sort of brush the dirt mm-hmm. off and and get back to it. It's it's not a straight line. Right. It's a very jagged, intimidating, uh, sometimes <laughs> exhausting experience. Uh, right. Nobody who does huge things just just uh, takes off like one smooth rocket shot. It's yeah. it's a roller coaster, and uh, I think people should keep in mind that whether it's the biggest names you can imagine, you know, the, the, the billionaires and the icons and the rock stars, all of these people have self doubt. They have moments where they want to give it all up and quit and just sleep under the covers and knock it out of bed for the day. Uh, so my definition of greatness is recognizing that's part of the human condition. You're not a failure. If you feel that way, mm-hmm. I certainly feel that way quite a bit. And uh, we were talking even today. I mean, sure. I'm really worried about the, uh, and anxious about the TV show. I've been fighting yeah. for this show for longer than I've worked on, uh, on a book. Yeah. And I, it's, uh, it's very intimidating and I don't think yeah. that goes away. Uh, but in face it's, it's not overcoming your fears all the time it's facing your fears and being like okay i'm afraid but i'm gonna keep on plugging away anyway Mm -hmm. so you know facing your fears and not necessarily worrying about always overcoming them but just being being uh confident enough or not even confident enough uh having taken the leap of faith to at least stand up and face your fears Mm -hmm. i think is my definition of greatness tim ferris thanks for coming on brother my pleasure thank you for having me